I remember the Germans came. The mob was screaming bloody murder. Killed the Jews. We were hiding in the cellar. They uh, broke into the store and were looting. We went downstairs after they left and there was nothing left. I still have nightmares to this day. We apparently got a letter that said, you have to leave Germany. We were the last train out of Berlin. What will sein mit uns? What will happen to us? The best hope for Jews was escape. Most of the world closed its doors, but one fledgling nation, the Philippines, did not. In this tropical paradise, thousands of miles from Europe, an unlikely group of poker players were planning a rescue. These poker players were Manuel Quezon, the country's newly elected president, Paul McNutt, U.S. High Commissioner to the Philippines, an ambitious army colonel named Dwight Eisenhower, and five cigar makers from Cincinnati, the Frieder brothers. They had a plan, a plan that would save more than 1,300 Jews from Nazi death camps, a plan for a rescue in the Philippines. Beginning in 1933, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi thugs steadily transformed first Germany, and then much of Europe, into a living nightmare for Jews. Then in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws came out, which stripped Jews of citizenship. All of their rights were slowly being stripped away. Jews were no longer Germans even if they had fought and bled for their country in previous wars. The violence peaked in November 1938 with a highly organized orgy of destruction and terror. It was called Kristallnacht because the glass from the broken windows glittered in the street like crystal. That night, my grandmother and I were all by ourselves and suddenly stones crashed through our windows. Then I knew that they were after us. We were hunted. When Kristallnacht was over, more than a hundred synagogues had burned. Thousands of Jewish businesses were destroyed. And tens of thousands of Jews were forced into concentration camps, all in the passage of just one night. Diplomats held meetings made speeches and passed resolutions. But little, if anything, was done. In one country half a world away, an escape plan to provide refuge for Jews was already underway. 6,000 miles from Berlin, the Philippines was a country most Europeans knew only from postcards. Much like the movie Casablanca, people lived by their own rules. Motor cars shared the roads with horse-drawn caramatas. Coca-Cola coexisted with carabaos. And at the legendary Manila Hotel, the elite could sit and share a drink in air-conditioned comfort. For centuries, Manila had welcomed refugees. It was really a, a fantastic mix of different peoples. Czechs, Poles, Latvians, uh, Lebanese, Middle East, uh, people from the Middle East, Indians. It was, uh, it was a mixture. And I think that was one thing that made Manila such a cosmopolitan center, because all these people coming and going, trading, staying, mixing, intermarrying. The Philippines was once a U.S. colony, but in 1935, President Franklin Roosevelt signed a law making it a semi-independent commonwealth promising complete independence in 10 years. I congratulate you, all of you. Mr. President, I want to express to you defense. President Manuel Quezon was determined his country would take its place among the great nations of the world. Manuel Luis Quezon was a complex person who made a deep and lasting impression on his country. Born poor, he moved into the world of wealth and power with easy bravado. 
he had the total assurance, self-assurance, that he was the equal of anyone he faced. There is a Filipino concept that we call the colonial mentality, this idea that you're inferior, that you're never quite as good. He never had that problem. He was a snappy dresser, you know, but he loved to dance and he loved to party too. One writer said, he is full of nerve and nerves. He's one of the world's best ballroom dancers, also one of the world's supplest and hardest boiled politicians. He loves cards and alcohol, and he loves his country. Manuel Quezon also loved the underdog. A man like Quezon, who himself had been a prisoner, uh, who had gotten malaria in the field, would have known what it's like to be on the run, to have no options, to a man working for the freedom of his country would certainly know what it's like when someone comes knocking at your door and says, we want to be free. I have been compelled to contrast our peace. While thousands America. marched in the United States to protest the horrors of Kristallnacht, in the Philippines, Manuel Quezon had already gone beyond protest to action, proclaiming that barring refugees was simply not right. Other countries perhaps did not think it that important. I, I don't presume to say. But I know that Dad had the moral courage to do it because he believed in the sanctity of human life and the right of people to live life as they believe they should. Athlete, scholar, movie star, they all appreciate a fine cigar, rich aroma, smokers... Hungarian immigrant Samuel Frieder began an empire by selling cigars out of his New York City home before World War I. Eventually, all five of his sons, Philip, Henry, Alex, Morris, and Herbert, were in the business. Cigars were big. The Frieders specialized in two-for-a-nickel cigars. And since the best of those were made from Philippine tobacco, they went right to the source. Philip, at age maybe 32 or 34, gets on a boat, takes him three and a half weeks to get to the Philippines, and the rest is history because when he's there, he meets all the growers and the manufacturers, and they start buying cigars from them directly. And then they figure out that it'd probably be more advantageous to them if they could do the manufacturing. The Frieders had developed a close relationship with President Quezon over the years. They met when Quezon was in the Philippine Senate, and they were young men building a business. The relationship deepened as the cigar business grew, and Quezon rose through the political ranks. In 1937, Paul V. McNutt was appointed U.S. High Commissioner for the Philippines and joined this circle of powerful friends. The former governor of Indiana, McNutt made no secret that he was aiming for the White House in 1940, which probably accounts for why President Roosevelt banished him to Manila. But for McNutt, moral conviction trumped political ambition. Urged by Jewish allies back home, he championed European Jews despite anti-Semitism among American voters. He understood very well intolerance in American life and intolerance in American politics. In their drive towards independence, the Filipinos had elected a Congress and inaugurated a president. But a separate Philippine immigration law had not yet been written. And in this legal vacuum, Paul McNutt realized that approving visas was one of the very few powers still held by the U.S. High Commissioner. And a visa was a powerful document that meant a Jewish family could escape from Nazi persecution. Despite all the smiles at his swearing in, McNutt's relationship with Kazan was complicated until they discovered a mutual passion, poker. McNutt loved poker so much that he even had monogrammed mother-of-pearl poker chips. There was one time when McNutt lost to him, when McNutt was trying to pay him, he said, 
don't pay me. Consider that my contribution to your candidacy. The games went long into the night. The Freeders were regulars at the table, and so was Colonel Dwight Eisenhower, the well-liked chief of staff for General Douglas MacArthur. Eisenhower was a fantastic card player. Uh, he managed to uh, pay for all of his expenses at West Point with his poker earnings, and he went on actually to give probably my grandmother her finest birthday presents based on his uh, card playing earnings. Americans like MacArthur or Eisenhower, they mingled freely and as equals with Filipinos, and the Filipinos deeply appreciated it. President Quezon especially appreciated Eisenhower's talents. Eisenhower was at one point writing speeches for my grandfather and was even given an office uh, in the executive building in the presidential palace. The card games were held in many places on the presidential yacht. My father played poker with him on his yacht just outside Malacanang Palace, where his yacht was moored on the Pasig River. In the air-conditioned lobby of the Manila Hotel. The Manila Hotel was the tops. It was a major uh, center of social activity. At the home of Greek-American private investigator, Angel Zervulakos. This kind of poker where the Frieder brothers come to, they come out looking like they've smoked a lot of cigars. <laughs> they sure smell like it, though. I do believe that my dad had a part in this, that helping the Frieder brothers, and, and he knew what they were doing. These high-stake games also took place in the cooling breeze of the Frieders' back porch. We could hear what was going on in the porch all the time. We could hear when someone brought food out to them or drinks out to them, but they were playing, uh, they were playing poker out there. It was at these games that the friends developed a plan to build upon the success of the Shanghai rescue. It was a cause close to all of them. McNutt called Jewish refugees helpless and persecuted wanderers with no place to lay their heads. Eisenhower wrote in his diary, Hitler's record with the Jews is as black as that of any barbarian of the Dark Ages. To Kazan, it was not a question of whether his country would help, but why other nations did not. For the Freeders, it simply needed to be done. They felt, because they were one of the 50 American Jewish families there, that that was the role everybody had to play if you're in, lucky enough to be in the Philippines. Try and get as many out as you could. The goal was to bring thousands of European Jews to the Philippines. But even with the legal authority to approve visas, Paul McNutt knew he needed to be holding a pair of pocket aces to deal with an unsympathetic State Department. One was support from President Quezon. Quezon had dealt with waves of immigrants before, and he was acutely aware of the voices of anti-Semitism in his own country. But Quezon stood strong. Even with Quezon's support, McNutt knew their plan could still be torpedoed because of the requirement that no immigrant could become a public charge. In other words, no money, no job, no visa. President Quezon had stipulated that he didn't want anybody that uh, would be a burden on the economy. And so the Jewish community had to uh, promise that they would take care of them, which they did. Kazan and McNutt turned to the Frieder brothers to work out a system so that only Jewish immigrants with the skills and resources to support themselves would be sent visas. And if the refugees did arrive penniless, the Jewish community would still take care of them. And so it began. The Jewish community prepared a list of occupations where they thought a refugee could get a job in the Philippines. That's when the ad came out in the main Jewish paper in Berlin, and it said that there's a place in the Philippines for people who have special skills. In a world where options were fast disappearing, there were finally answers to the desperate pleas that arrived every day. The Freeders and others on the refugee committee 
chose who would be approved for a visa. These lists were then sent to Kazan for review, and McNutt passed them to the State Department and U.S. embassies in Europe. The United States is crossed out, and it's written Philippine Islands only. Now, plans could be made. More than a month after McNutt had begun his Maverick visa process, the State Department caught on, demanding information about hundreds of Jews who were applying for visas to the Philippines. McNutt replied coolly that many refugees had already arrived, and then upped the ante, saying that a hundred additional families were on their way. McNutt bucked the State Department. The State Department wasn't very nice in those days, and I think he gambled his whole political career on doing this. We've got to remember what the temper of the country was, the mood of the United States and the American people. You had a, an, an antipathy toward more refugees. You had inertia and anti-Semitism in the State Department. And you had a president and an administration that was really only intermittently interested in the question. That confronts the, the U.S. Secretary of State pointedly warned the Philippine government that they still had to abide by U.S. immigration policy. But Kazan and McNutt stayed resolute. And while this bureaucratic battle raged, desperate passengers fleeing Europe on the SS St. Louis were denied entry to Cuba, the United States, and Canada. They were forced back to an uncertain future in Europe, a Europe where the systematic murder of millions began with the invasion of Poland in 1939. Concentration camps would soon transform into death camps, and the trains filled with helpless victims begin to roll. You know, there's this city at the bottom of like a U-shaped bay, Manila Bay, and at the end of the bay, the two arms, one was called Batan, and there was an island there called Corregidor, which was like the cork in the bottle. On Manila side, there was a beautiful drive called Dewey Boulevard. And on the shore side, there were the magnificent hotels. Fancy Manila Hotel was the big one. But anybody could walk on, on Dewey Boulevard, watch the sunset. And if you've never seen a sunset in the tropics, it's absolutely incredible. We arrived on Hitler's birthday, April 20th, five days before my 13th birthday. My aunt and uncle were there to greet us, and then I don't remember even getting off the boat, but I do remember that they took us to a apartment that we shared with somebody else, with another couple. While this new life may have been difficult for the adults, for the children, it was an adventure. One time, my mother and my sister and I went hiking, and we strayed a little bit far out and the natives in that area that were called Igorots. And we came to an Igorot village where on the fence, on the gate, they had a couple of heads. So they were still headhunters. We turned around quickly. Harry Brower, who was one of my dad's best friends uh, growing up, they were so close that um, Uncle Harry used to sleep over in the palace. I led this strange life, you know. I lived in a small house. My parents were running a little restaurant. And every Saturday, a chauffeured limousine came and picked me up and took me to Malacanang Palace. I remember the papaya trees. The marvel of the papaya tree is that it's a tall tree, but it's flat. It's not flat, it's angled. So the, the adventure of climbing up with your friends on a papaya tree. That was fun. For many children, Temple Emil, the only synagogue in the Philippines, was the center of their lives. As the number of refugees swelled, President Quezon donated a portion of his country estate for a community house. It was named Marikina Hall. Dozens of refugees attended the opening ceremony a celebration for the entire community. Marikina Hall was actually 
property that he had bought that was supposed to be the nest egg for my father. It was going to be the land that would make sure that my father would have a good living after his father was president. This is what he devoted for, for the place uh, that the refugees could stay in. At the dedication of Mar Marikino Hall, there were the speeches. And that was very evident that they wanted 10,000 Jews, Kazan and the Freeders were helping to come to the Philippines. President Kazan was speaking of a plan to bring tens of thousands of Jews to establish a farming community on the remote island of Mindanao. Keen observers of world events, the poker players were well aware that time was running out for European Jews. So they once again upped the ante. Paul McNutt informed the State Department that Kazan was willing to take as many as 30,000 Jewish families. According to Philip Frieder, President Kazan was in favor of settling as many refugees as possible on Mindanao, saying he'd be happy if a million arrived. Kazan was a good Catholic, and he thought the most unreligious thing he could think of was to think badly towards the people that gave them their savior. And I just love that quote. The reaction from the U.S. State Department was negative. One memo said that 2,000, not 30,000, was a more realistic number, and warned that, quote, few members of the Caucasian race can endure the hardships of the jungle island. Despite this opposition, Kazan kept pressing to settle refugees on Mindanao, although the plan was lowered to 10,000 families and stretched out over a period of many years. On November 21, 1941, the final contract for the purchase of land in Mindanao arrived in New York. The poker players had bet the pot, and they had won. Thousands more refugees could come to the Philippines. But circumstances quickly changed everything. Days later, all attempts at rescue and relocation ended as Japanese warplanes attacked Pearl Harbor. Within hours, Japanese bombers also appeared over Manila. And the bomb attacks continued even after MacArthur pulled the American troops out of Manila and declared it an open city. In a matter of months, MacArthur and the Kazan family had been forced to evacuate, and Manila was occupied by the Japanese. It marked the beginning of years of privation, suffering, and death for Filipinos and refugees alike. It was about three or four in the morning, I believe, and, and uh, this great big bang bang on the front door, they were literally tearing it down. And then they came upstairs and we were all asleep and then wake up this bayonets looking at, down at you. I can picture us walking down the street and the sun wasn't up yet and it was dark and we were all following my dad. We couldn't even look at anything that we left behind. So we just, from the bed to the street. And they made our home their officer's quarters. The Japanese conquered the rest of the Philippines, starving out the last American military outposts on Bataan and Corregidor, and marching the soldiers off to brutal prison camps. After almost three long years of Japanese occupation, General MacArthur made good on his promise to return and liberate the Philippines. But the war was not over, and despite MacArthur's return, the worst was yet to come. Japanese Supreme Command issued orders to kill or burn everything in their path as they retreated from Manila. You could see Manila burning for a whole week. And it was so bright, and it never died for a whole week or so, and the fires were just burning and burning and burning. And we were right in the middle of it. The horror of being caught between two armies seemed like it would go on forever. 
By September 1945, Japan had surrendered and thousands gathered in Manila to celebrate the high holidays. American GIs rebuilt Temple Emil, which had been destroyed by the Japanese. Fittingly, the fundraising for the new temple began with a ceremony on November 9, 1945, the anniversary of Kristallnacht. The poker players quietly moved on, but they remain forever linked to the lives of over 1,300 Jewish refugees. The Frieder's cigar factories had been leveled, and the Frieder brothers began the task of rebuilding the family business back in the States. Paul McNutt returned to Manila and lowered the American flag on the day the Philippines gained independence. Dwight Eisenhower, now the supreme commander of NATO, made a low-key inspection to the ruins of the city where he had spent so many years. Manuel Quezon died in exile in the United States. He never got to see the Philippine independence which he had fought so hard for, but his accomplishments live on. Most Filipinos are familiar with Schindler's List. Very few Filipinos know that uh, Quezon was in his own way a kind of Schindler. And it has come out, and I think people have been proud of that. that there were good people. There were people that were saved. You have to give thanks to those people. It would be much simpler to understand, OK, the Freeders somehow put up money and figured out a way to get visas and did it. Or simpler to understand Kazan somehow acting on his own, having this epiphany of helping somebody and, you know, doing it. But the fact that, you know, he is a Catholic and McNutt is a Protestant and, and the Frieders as, as Jews um, come together, make it even more rich and, and interesting and, um, and incredible that it happened. In that historical moment, they were heroes, but they don't necessarily see themselves as heroes. They were, it looks like they were just doing the right thing and they responded to a crisis in the right way, uh, regardless of the fact that it wasn't uh, necessarily great for their careers as a president or as a representative of the military, or even for a career as a cigar maker. Somebody has to take a risk. Somebody has to put their uh, values on the line and say, we're gonna do it. To me, Hitler lost two wars. He lost the regular war, and he lost the war against the Jews. At the Open Doors Monument in Israel are written the words of President Manuel Quezon. It is my hope, and indeed my expectation, that the people of the Philippines will have in the future every reason to be glad that when the time of need came, their country was willing to extend a hand of welcome.